They built aircraft that could go into spots that no other aircraft could go in. It made places accessible that were never accessible before. There's nothing else that can do that job that successfully. It's so tough. They just don't build planes like that. You can always rely on the beaver. There just isn't any airplane that uh, can do what a beaver can do. It's a fun airplane to fly, and it gets in almost any place. It makes me happy to get in it, that's all I can say. Rows of old military planes rusting in the hot desert sun. But things are about to change for this de Havilland Beaver, affectionately known as Olivia. She's going to be restored, upgraded, and fit with the latest in aviation technology. Ted Giroux, Director of Aircraft Maintenance and his team from Viking Air, arrive to disassemble Olivia and prepare her for her shipment to Canada. This is exciting because um you know, it's not too often you have an original military beaver that's been sitting around for decades in the desert, just waiting to be uh, regenerated. If an airframe could talk, I'm sure this would have a lot to talk about. Ted plans to bring her back from the desert and update her to become the quintessential modern day beaver. You know, the, the notion that an airplane will wear out or there's some kind of age limit on an aircraft doesn't really make much sense anymore. With the capabilities that we have uh, come up with for, for restoration techniques, well, they're tough old birds, and uh, given half a chance, they can usually uh, be brought back from whatever happens to them. A lot of the float planes have been to the bottom at least once or twice. Somebody will find one, pull it out, and put it back in the air. Actor Harrison Ford is an avid pilot. He was so impressed with the plane that he chose to rescue his own military beaver and have it expertly restored. The first time I flew a beaver was uh, after I uh, agreed to do a film called Six Days, Seven Nights. This is my plane. Uh huh. This is a de Havilland beaver. This is one of the safest, most reliable aircraft ever built. I think that's the line. It was after that film completed that I decided I wanted one a beaver of my own and set out to try and find one and do the work on it to restore it to pristine condition. I wanted a, an aircraft that was as good as new and maybe a little better. The beaver's original design was conceived in the early 1940s by the team at the de Havilland Aircraft Company of Canada located just north of Toronto. In that building, small teams of engineers and designers basically gathered around work tables and benches and built the aircraft that we know as the Beaver. De Havilland Canada's goal was to open up Canada's north in much the same way the railway opened the west. The Beaver was conceived as a half-ton flying pickup truck capable of taking off and landing in very short distances on land, water, or snow. One of the leading figures in the development of the beaver is PC Garrett, Philip Garrett. Garrett, as head of the company, recognized during the war that the company had to enter the commercial market in order to survive. There was no promise of government contracts at the end of the war. Phil wanted to produce the first Canadian all-metal bush plane, and he wanted it to have stole characteristics and lots of power. That's what pilots ask for. The Beaver was a risk. It was a huge risk. They basically were betting the company on this airplane, the bush plane. But they knew there was a market requirement. Olivia is a pretty nice name for this beaver. It's a classy name for a classy airplane. The plan is to get Olivia ready in time to attend the beaver's 60th anniversary celebration. To be held on the grounds of the original factory, Olivia will be stripped down to her frame. She'll get a modern engine 
extra seats, doors, windows, fuel tanks, new avionics, and amphibious floats making her capable of landing on virtually all terrain. It's going to be a monumental task. See, it's pretty rough. Sitting in the desert too long, we got somebody pulled the emergency fuel oil shut off the air, there's no oil in it. And this little lever on the, I've never actually really seen one of these before. This is a little lever that you would use to hand crank your engine from the starter. It's kind of, it's kind of neat. Another interesting item, it's got right hand, left hand arming. Uh, this is the, the release for the bomb uh, mechanisms. Oh, oh, oh boy. <laughs> Needs a bit of work. And you know what? We're just the people to do it. By the 1940s, bush planes represented a vital link to the isolated communities across Canada. It's an essential service for most of the north, and there's always this temptation to load the airplane up. But at the same time, you have to get off the lake and you have to clear the trees at the end of the lake. So you have this conundrum, maximum payload, but you still want to get off and clear the trees. Because if you find yourself a little low, and the trees around the lake coming up fast, you want to be able to pull up and, 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 uh, and you can do that in a beaver. De Havilland embarked on an ambitious and extensive market research process, virtually unheard of at that time. They were way ahead of their time when it came to marketing airplanes and, and um, making an airplane fit a market. The Beaver was a lot of bush pilots' ideas put together of just what they would like to, to see, what would help them with their work in flying these airplanes. And, and remember, they had to make a living with them, and that was difficult. This typewritten survey had to reach pilots working under extreme conditions in remote locations. The enthusiastic response from the bush pilots, and especially the dean of bush pilots, Punch Dickens, turned out to be a key ingredient for the Beaver's success. Punch probably knew the North better than anyone else during the time that he spent there. He was one of those pilots who had to fly by the seat of his pants. When it was pointed out that, that this airplane was not going to be very fast, he said, all you have to do is be able to fly faster than a dog sled. Ideas from some of Canada's greatest aviation heroes were incorporated into the design, customizing it for optimum bush performance. With all the answers that he got back from the pilots and all the encouragements to build this airplane, they went ahead. They really had their heart and soul in it. There is a phenomenon known as beaver hunting, and Neil Aird is known to many as King Beaver. His early interest in the plane has become a lifelong passion, and now, a full-time job. I decided to do planes that were about the same age as I was. The beaver was born I say it was conceived probably around 1946. And they've gone off all over the world and they've come back to Canada. I thought, well, this is Canadian. I'm a new Canadian. Well, I'd like to gradually try to find out what happened to most of the Beaver aircraft and try to have each one uh, represented. It's detective work and it's, it's like uh, the mother load, you know, you're panning for gold and suddenly there's a nugget. It's like a hunter, you know. You don't know if the quarry is going to be there or not. <laughs> Aird aims to create a virtual museum for all 1,692 beavers ever made. His website has fostered over half a million hits and is headquarters for over 300 members from more than 100 countries. I always say that even people who are not interested in airplanes can get a lot of pleasure from it because each beaver aircraft will be in a remarkable setting, be it the Canadian bush, the Sahara Desert, the high Arctic, and people expect there to be a new beaver every day. People in Romania, United Arab Emirates, something like 110 countries now people have been looking. Neil tracks the lifespan and history of every beaver he can find including Olivia. She's very popular. There she is. After serving in the Korean War, Olivia worked for the Texas Department of Agriculture before ending up at the Pima Air and Space Museum. I presume she's going to get a Canadian registration. Oh yeah, they're trying to get 
C G O D H as Olivia de Havilland. Despite all of the advancements in technology destined for Olivia, much of her work will be done by hand, just as de Havilland built them so many years before. Okay, well this is plan A to do it with a screwdriver. I'm not gonna tell you what plan C is. <laughs> and those are the easy ones. You should see these ones in here. Olivia's wings and other components are removed so that she can fit onto a flatbed truck that will take her to Victoria, British Columbia. Man, that seems so easy. We're going to lift, raise the airplane, but because of the way the wind's blowing, we'll need Dave in the back to sort of hold it because it's one, the tail's gonna want to swing. Right, it's right back here. This could get exciting. Exciting's good. Too exciting is not so good. And having the camera is even worse. You okay? Yeah, I got it. If, yell if you need help. Okay, Dave, we're moving. Okay, that's good. Is that center right there? In 1946, Ontario's Department of Lands and Forests recognized the need to replace their fleet of cloth bush planes, and it pitted two of Canada's leading plane builders against each other, de Havilland's Beaver versus Fairchild's Husky. The race was on. Both the design of the Husky and the Beaver were quite innovative for their day. They had to keep it highly aerodynamic, and they had to keep it small. The company was at stake. Try to secure it all up so it ends up back home in one piece. Not all over the road. It'll be fine. Olivia begins the long trip from Tucson, Arizona to Victoria, British Columbia. It's the first step in an extraordinary transformation. To me, it was really goggly-eyed air, airplane. You got in your goggly eyes. <laughs> it was so nice. <laughs> the Beaver is unique in my experience for an aircraft of that size. It's incredibly well balanced and light on the controls. You really can't fly it with two fingers. And uh, pilots will tell you that the reason they love the Beaver is that it has an excess of power. I don't know. It's just a, it's a magical experience. It's fun. <laughs> This is an airplane that grew organically out of a need for an aircraft that could uh, go into unimproved strips, land on roads, beaches, carry a hell of a load, and take a fair amount of abuse. The long journey from the Arizona desert to the Pacific coast is over. The restoration of the former military beaver, Olivia, is just beginning. After 30 years of service, and 20 more lying forgotten in the desert, her next flight will be as a brand new airplane. Back in 1946, the Beaver's designers at de Havilland had to answer a number of critical questions before a prototype plane could be built. Because de Havilland was an English company, they originally conceived of this aircraft as being powered by an English engine. The plane as it looked was gonna be underpowered. And that was a complaint with all the Bush, Bush aircraft. They were all underpowered. Their solution was to devise a huge wing to compensate for the underpowered engine. I was in Montreal with Phil Garrett, our managing director, and uh, we were having uh, drinks and some dinner with the chairman of Pratt & Whitney Canada. And he said, why don't you put the Wasp Junior uh, into the Beaver. There are lots of these surplus engines around and it will give you more power. The Pratt & Whitney Wasp Junior R985 engine was first designed in 1928. It was strong enough and provided even more power than the design now required. The unmistakable sound of the classic rotary engine is recognized the world over. Oh, well, there's nothing 
in the world that sounds quite like a, that engine. And it's got a distinctive voice, one that's easily recognized. A lot of people use the analogy that it sounds like a Harley Davidson, and it, and it does. It's, it's music to most people that hear it. Even the pilots that have become deaf listening to it, uh, they love that sound. <laughs> They're a noisy airplane, but uh, round engines are music, as far as I'm concerned. To me, and to many people, it's like hearing a loon on a lake. If I hear a beaver taking off, No matter where it is, my ears will perk up. I mean, this engine's 1928 technology, and here we are, you know, in the 21st century, still driving along merrily. Sometimes they're time capsules. Department of Army Technical Manual. Department of the Army, 1965. All the weathered and worn parts of the old Olivia are shed to make way for her modern makeover. The team at Viking is determined. They want her airborne in time for the 60th anniversary of the test flight in 1947. The first Beaver to ever be flown was air tested by two pilots. George Neal and Russ Bannock. This is a, a big thrill of me to have them on the website. In the There's George. Hey. <laughs> Hi, George. Nice to see you. <laughs> In familiar ground. Eh? Russ came from uh, the Air Force. He was flying mosquitoes overseas during the war. And he came over out of the Air Force and right into the civvy job. And that's where they had the, the beaver when uh, they rolled out for you to fly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the competition was already well into prototype test flying. The manufacturing team at de Havilland had to work fast, and the clock was ticking. So I waited until they called me to come down and uh, uh, fly the airplane. There were a number of the engineering people and staff here watching, so I simply piled into the airplane and got the engine started, and it taxied out onto the runway. And after I was satisfied that the controls were all working fine, I actually took off. We had a problem on the first flight. I was checking all the instruments and noticed that the oil pressure was going down fairly rapidly. When it was getting close to zero, I realized I'd better land. There was something wrong, so I simply uh, throttled right back and did a glide approach and landing. When they drained the oil out after doing engine runs in the morning, there was a, a non-return valve in the drain that was put in backwards. And so 20 odd minutes, it siphoned the oil out. Uh, and fortunately, I had uh, shut the engine down so it didn't do any damage. Taken off in a little plane with a oil scavenge pump, uh, installed upside down, you know, you, you wonder, these, the, these guys hadn't done a lot of this sort of stuff. And two hours later I came down and jumped in the airplane and took off again. And this time I stayed in the air uh, pretty close to an hour. I was really quite pleased with the way it handled uh, on that particular flight. But it jumped right off the runway and uh, landing, make an approach at 75 miles an hour and it's touched down and uh, I could have stopped in less than 100 yards. So that confirmed that it was uh, going to be a real stole airplane, short takeoff and landing. The Beaver would prove itself to be the first aircraft with short takeoff and landing capabilities. And some would say the best, even to this day. We didn't have any backlog of orders. It was only a prototype. Russ checked me out in the Beaver, the land plane, of course, and then he t turned it over to me when we wanted to do the float work. You could just feel that airplane leap into the air, and it did, it just leaped into the air. Well, then when I got it down on floats, we got airborne in about 10, 11 seconds. So that was just out of this world, and it'll always be known as 
the first fantastic airplane, the Stoll operation out of it. It was so advanced, it's just fantastic. There wasn't anything to touch it. Despite the apparent advantage of the Beaver, people tested the Husky. The Husky's larger capacity made more demands on the Wasp Junior engine than the smaller design of the Beaver. Favor soon turned to the plane with superior performance. You could tell, as soon as you compared the two of them, that the Husky was going to use all the power that that engine could produce, and the Beaver was not. And it really was as simple as that. And it wasn't too long after we got into prototype flying that we got an order for six Beavers from the Ontario Department of Lands and Forests. The Husky was defeated, and in the end, only 12 were ever produced. News of the Beaver's performance spread rapidly across the country. But in order for the Beaver to become a commercial success, de Havilland had to achieve sales beyond the needs of the Ontario government. It is an, a remarkably useful airplane. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's, it's meant to be heavily loaded and taken in and out of short, unimproved strips. Still a lot of use for it. Over the years, it has developed into the finest float plane that was ever built. Former surplus army beaver, Olivia, is almost halfway through being rebuilt into a state-of-the-art bush plane. The bulkhead looks like a toilet seat. We always call it the toilet seat here. Basically, you see, he's all reskinned it all, made it look real nice and pretty, and uh, it's coming along with One of the most crucial structural elements is the support frame of the engine, known as the bird cage. So this bird cage actually came from this beaver when it came in. We sent it for NDT, non-destructive testing. He did ultrasonic testing on it, checked out all the tube thicknesses, make sure there's no corrosion inside. It actually turned up one of the best we've ever found. That This thing was like brand new inside, so living in the Arizona desert is a good thing for these planes. Sales of Beaver aircraft were not significant in the early days. De Havilland couldn't sustain more than one or two aircraft a month. The 11th Search and Rescue Squadron in Alaska advertised that they were looking for a bush plane that they could operate on floats, in and out of rivers, and small lakes. So I planned a trip to uh, Alaska. Uh, after showing it to Colonel Balkan and some of his staff, he asked if we could take them fishing to some particular spot where they had difficulty getting into. They'd have to drive in with a jeep for about 20 or 30 miles. The performance of the Havilland Stull aircraft was so much superior to other aircraft of its day that it was essential to show the customer what the aircraft could do. Test pilots really played the role of salespeople. They were really very much showmen in their era. I think I took about five people into this uh, lay. It really was a river. When I landed on this river, it wasn't very deep. It was kind of winding. He didn't know when he'd landed them on this creek, basically. Um, he didn't know that he was going to be able to take off from there. While the brass were fishing, he was pounding stakes at the mi minimum distance and before he had to you know, change direction in taking off. He had to change direction several times to do that. And that impressed them. That really impressed them because the load was heavier. They, they caught a lot of fish, everybody had a good time, but they were astounded by what, they, what the airplane could do. Cessna had sent up a Cessna 195 to try to get this business. The two of us lined up and we took off side by side and I think I was airborne and 300 feet in the air when the Cessna was still, still on the water. For the U.S. military to order a foreign-built aircraft, the Beaver would have to prove itself against the best America had to offer. The Beaver beat the competing aircraft hands down, 
and the political obstacles that may have existed soon disappeared. Not only did the beaver win the day against stiff U.S. competition, but de Havilland secured the purchase of an impressive 973 beavers. It was unprecedented, first of all. No Canadian company has ever done that before or, or since. Uh, that's a thousand airplanes. Beaver orders and production soared to 20, 30 aircraft a month. When you look at Canadian built aircraft, the Beaver today still holds the rank as the most produced aircraft. No other aircraft comes close. Now the Beaver happened to cut its teeth in, in Korea. It was known as the General's Jeep. It did a lot of things like string wire, communication wire across valleys, transport wounded soldiers to and from the field, uh, act as indeed, you know, a Jeep for General Eisenhower when he went touring. Well, the, uh, the Beaver was a tremendous aircraft for us out in the field. And once a pilot got checked out in it, it was like putting on your own coat. You were that comfortable with it. We were all attached to it and still are. <laughs> the man who flew this aircraft in Vietnam and other places during the Vietnam War flew this aircraft for uh, Air America, which of course is the unofficial airline of the CIA. For whatever reason, they put a patch in there. Maybe there was a dent there or a hole there or something. But it doesn't look very pretty, so we'll get rid of it. There aren't too many of the original skins left in the airplane, because uh, sometimes it's quicker to replace a whole skin panel than to uh, repair a damaged part on it. And this way you get a brand new panel. The Viking crew hurries to have Olivia completed in time to attend the anniversary of the Beaver's six decades of service. Hey Jeannie, looks like they like the scheme. She's like a desert queen that's being resurrected. I mean, she spent 20 years in a museum and I don't think they ever thought she'd fly again and she's going to fly again. My job as the mechanical cosmetician is to turn her into this. Today, maintaining and restoring existing beaver planes is the only way to meet market demand. But in the 50s and 60s, the Haviland Canada saw an ever-increasing stream of customers for beavers, spurred by the large sale to the U.S. Army. We sold almost a thousand beavers. The fact that you sell beavers in that number to the U.S. military makes it attractive to commercial people around the world. If the, uh, American Army think it's so good, maybe we should have a look at it. It allowed the sale of a lot of other commercial airplanes. Wherever we went, we seemed to sell airplanes. We sold beavers to other air forces, like the Austrian Air Force, the, uh, the Dutch Air Force. The British Army had 46 beaver aircraft delivered. Uh, they flew in just about every part of the world. And we had them in service for 27 years until 1989. This is an illustration of our last beaver. It's still flying in military regulation colors. It's still flying on the British military register. Um, and we've had it as part of our historic aircraft flight now uh, since 1990. And it's very much a, uh, a display draw. People come to look at this airplane because of its history in the British Army. But we've operated the aircraft across the globe. Sometimes some of the operations the Beavers went into in, in, in wars in, uh, in the Middle East or in the Far East, right down in the dirt next to the soldiers who are actually doing the fighting, resupplying them, casualty evacuation. You could always rely on a Beaver. And I think actually most of us are, are disappointed it's no longer in service. Kelly did excellent body work to her, so all her cellulite's gone, so she's nice and smooth. And why that's so important to me, Olivia's going to get a de Havilland symbol that'll have a, an airplane in the middle, and it'll be the same colors, contrasting colors as her stripes, so it'll be red and gold, and that'll look really cool because her tail will be very flashy, and that's very important on a nice lady. <laughs> Nothing's ever been built that does what the Beaver does today. Absolutely immortal uh, in British Army service. It will go on for many years to come. So it's current, current history, living history.
Beaver planes have not been produced since 1967, yet they are still highly sought after as the definitive bush plane. The million dollar restoration of Olivia is easily justified. In the mid 60s, aviation technology was advancing fast. New turbine engines opened up the industry for faster, quieter travel. De Havilland Canada modified the original piston engine Beaver design to incorporate the new technology, giving the Beaver an even higher rate of climb, greater altitude, and the ability to carry heavier payloads. What was the reasoning behind stopping the Turbo Beaver production at 60? This was a, a character named Ted Emmert, who was the, uh, uh, became chairman of uh, Hawker Sidley Canada, which had taken over De Havilland. And he had the idea that we should get out of these small airplanes and get into bigger airplanes. And he just directed that production be stopped, which was kind of stupid. To look. Somebody could actually put the Turbo Beaver back into production. There'd be a market for it. After only 60 turbos were made, de Havilland began to shift its focus towards larger airliners. Despite the increasing popularity of the Beaver, the entire line was shut down, and production ended in 1967. And you see I've got the crew, Brian and James, building up the, the brand new PT6-34 engine. All the sheet metal aspects of the conversion has been completed, so this is a milestone for the Turbo Beaver project. It's just so easy to damage it up, you know, you got three or four people putting the engine in and if you ding the side of the engine case, the engine has to be shipped back to an uh, overhaul facility to be repaired. But the problem here is that we don't have any extra time to put the airplane together. We just can't afford to, to have anything like that happen. They're hoping we're going to have the airplane completed before they go to the show. It's going to be pretty close. You never know if the airplane's going to teach you a little lesson right at the very end. You know, as long as we concentrate on what we're doing, I think we'll be okay. After more than 50 years, the demand for the Beaver remains. Because they're not manufactured anymore, the fleet is technically getting smaller. The value of the aircraft is such that you can do it economically by rebuilding an airplane. Can you ask him to stop hammering for like 20 minutes? Our airplane embodies conversions and, and upgrades from other companies too that we've certified for, for use on the Turbo Beaver uh, and on the Piston Beaver and you know so I think it's an industry effort. It's unbelievable the industry that is developed around a product that hasn't been in production for you know 40 years. Well a great airplane doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of things that can be done to it to make it even greater. For instance this one has an AOG uh, stole kit which is a leading edge cuff, drooped uh, wing tips, and uh, a reset of the wing angle, which makes the plane fly flatter. It goes a little faster and lands a little slower. Open, you can put an ATV inside this airplane. You can put practically anything. If you could fit an elephant through the door, you could, you could fly with it. It's quite incredible. The aircraft has evolved and adapted with the generations to perform many more modern roles. When I first came to Kenmore Air Harbor, we had one de Havilland Beaver. Every pilot was jealous of whoever wasn't flying it, you know? And so pretty soon we got another airplane and then another airplane. Since we were operating the airplanes ourselves, we would find that the airplane itself had a few shortcomings. Kenmore Air was the next company to modify the design with new ideas and modern technology. We were able to develop different modifications for the airplane. We were the very first ones to do these modifications. We put a steering system, so now we have steering improvement, and that made the pilots very happy. Well, the original steps were round steel tubes with three people sitting across. The largest part of your body is the shoulders, and so the shoulder sticks out right into this area where the flat window was, and now it's a bubble. Just about every beaver seaplane flying in the world now, I think, has one or two or several of the Kenmore modifications. So it's kind of fun to see how it's been accepted around the world in the beaver market. 
A lot of the little things that, uh, that Kenmore pioneered are, are part of the package on this airplane. Near the end of the Vietnam War, the helicopter was quickly becoming the aircraft of choice for Army operations. The surviving beavers were made surplus. That was the beginning of our beaver rebuild program. Forty years later now, I think over 130 beavers have come through our shop, been rebuilt and so forth. It's quite exciting to have seen the condition a lot of these military surplus planes came in, mothballed, hadn't flown for years, to a final rebuild. It's it was quite amazing to see that. One of our big markets was refurbishing the beavers and selling them to Alaska operators. Kenmore Air is one of the largest and busiest beaver operators in America. It's here that Harrison Ford's beaver was rebuilt. I visited quite a few times while Kenmore were putting the uh, airplane together, and uh, it was everything I, I hoped it would be. I think it was one of the military fuselages still here that we were able to rebuild for him and fix him up with a nice airplane that seems to be real happy flying it all around the country. Flying low level across this country, you get to see not just the great natural beauty of the country and the scope of it, but the sense of the history of the country, the way it grew up. I love uh, taking on new challenges, like short strips and crosswind and tailwheel airplanes. And, and it's beautiful. 8,500 feet over Briley, Idaho. Not a bad way to spend the afternoon. After much anticipation, Olivia's airframe is seeing engine power for the first time in decades. It's nice to hear that sound of that engine running. And especially when everything's working like that, you know, we breathe some new life into it today. I think it's going to be a battle right to the end to see if we're going to finish on time or not. This aircraft harkens back to the time when uh, airplanes were much simpler machines than they are now. Where are you going? Rosie! Rosie, what are you doing? I can't fly this thing! I guess part of the simplicity results in a feel and a contact with the airplane that you don't have, perhaps with some other more complex airplanes. Although no new beavers have been made since de Havilland stopped production in 1967, they are still much in demand. Prospective buyers have to hunt down, rescue, and restore old surplus planes like Olivia. Floats are on, the engine's on, the tail's on, and once we get the wings on, we can finish rigging the flight controls. So, yeah, I mean, there's only, what, a week till they want to depart, so there's not much time left. <laughs> a few remaining days left until takeoff. Olivia is in final assembly. The second maiden voyage will see her return to that very hangar she was built in over half a century ago. You can see we've got the wings on uh, Olivia, and she doesn't even look close to the airplane that I went down and took apart in Arizona. It's, uh, it's like a, basically like a, like a moth turning into a butterfly, so to speak. First time it's been flying in 30 years, and we're all looking forward to it. And uh, Dave Curtis over here is actually really looking forward to it because it's. Uh, it's his baby. And actually what you see here is a total of about 5,900 man hours. And it's quite a bit because we had to do a lot of work. We've been sitting in the desert for 30 years. And, and in a few more minutes, we're gonna go flying. Make sure we don't do any hangar rash on it. Olivia is transformed into a high-tech marble, ready to cross the country in honor of the Beaver's 60th year in service. The, uh, the plane was found in the Arizona desert. We fell in love with it. Uh, it had a name, Olivia. And Olivia de Havilland, movie star. <laughs> Perhaps, yes. It is a plane. Very 
excited to, you know, to be able to, uh, to take this airplane to Toronto to the, uh, to the show. Perform beautifully on the test flight, it's like a new airplane. After only 1.8 hours of test flying, Viking Air's chief pilot, Don Behrens, begins the 4,500 kilometer trip across the country. Where do you suppose it is? Sounds like it's right over the belly. There it is. There it is. I see it. Oh, isn't it pretty? Restored military beaver, Olivia crosses Canada's vast expanse with just days remaining before the 60th anniversary celebrations are set to begin in Ontario. Terrain ahead, pull up. You reckon? Either uh, just uh, off of Nelson uh, two minutes ago uh, and we're eastbound down a flight plan to activate if it's not already. She's flying higher, faster, and farther between stops than she ever has before. So here we are in Sault Ste. Marie, we're within a couple hours of, uh, of Downsview, her birthplace. Well, there was a couple of uh, instances along the way where the weather was a little on the sketchy side, but, uh, but we managed to make it through. Oscar Delta Hotel, turn it on Atlantic Downsview. Olivia now finds herself back on the very tarmac from which she first took flight. While we certainly purchased all the rights to the airplanes, I, I look at it more like we're the stewards. I hope to be here in 40 years on a panel, you know? <laughs> the Beaver's original test pilot, Russ Bannock, flew to the event in his son Michael's own Turbo Beaver, and now meet the newest restored Beaver for the first time. There's any difference for speed, but uh, there he is. Hi, dude. Do you know my daughter's name is Olivia? Yes, I know that. Uh, yeah. Olivia de Havilland. And you saw the registration? <laughs> yes, on I did. She I, was here. Uh, with Olivia de Havilland. I met her. Yeah, my mother still talks about this. Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a number in mind of uh, beavers you thought you'd sell? Yeah, we, we know, sure. We thought we'd sell a couple of hundred beavers. Uh, and, uh, you know, with a bit of luck, we might sell four or five hundred. We never ever thought we'd sell almost 2,000. <laughs> Why is the piston beaver uh, floats selling for a half a million dollars uh, when it originally sold for $30,000 with floats? <laughs> yeah. And that's because there's nothing to replace it. You know, that's right. Modern beavers are still being used every day for agricultural and surveying work and by commercial operators, commuters, and tourists across the globe. One of the things I like best about flying, I guess, is that when I'm up here, I'm another pilot, another airplane, not a movie actor. First uh, tailwheel airplane I flew was the de Havilland Beaver. I'd never really seen one uh, up close. Very impressive airplane. It spreads over so many years and it's not finished yet. The beaver, uh, well, they call it the immortal beaver, and it is. I never really thought that uh, when I did the first flight 60 years ago, they would still be flying off of this same runway, same airfield, in a turbo beaver 60 years later. Original test pilot Russ Bannock takes off from the very same runway that the Beaver first flew from some 60 years before. Open 
clear to go. We're clear to go. Everything looks good there. something that burns its way into your psyche. It's a, a beautiful thing. Makes me happy to get in it, that's all I can say. <laughs>